This morning we have moved from chapter 3 of last week to chapter 12 of this week uh, in the book of Exodus. Last week we heard the story of Moses being called, uh, God's voice coming to him from the bush that was on fire, but the bush was intact, it was not being consumed. And uh, Moses had lots of excellent reasons why he was not the man for this job that God had for him. Uh, His first excuse was, I'm not good enough, Exodus 3.11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children out of Egypt? Reminding us that God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. God sees in us things that we even do not see about ourselves. Uh, His next excuse, I don't have all the answers. Uh, And he uses as his his excuse, well, if they ask me for your name, what will I tell them? Names in this culture were very important. They had meaning and power. And so this is the point at which God says to him, tell them that I am sent you, for I am who I am. Then he says, well, nobody's going to believe me. You know, nobody's going to believe that you sent me. I mean, that's just not going to happen. And God says, well, what's that you have in your hand? And he says, a staff, you know, like a big old walking stick. And so God says, throw it on the ground. And Moses throws it on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And then God says, pick it up. And he picks it up, and it becomes a staff again. Now, this is my favorite one, because what this... Uh, has always told me about God is that God uses ways to communicate and reach us in ways that we will hear. Now, if I walked in with a staff that turned into a snake, do you think that would be persuasive or terrifying? I'm going with terrifying. Um, But in that day and time, it was persuasive. Uh, And there are other ways that God uses to Uh, remind us, to teach us, to reveal God's self to us. Uh, One of my favorite proofs of God's existence and grace is is that the church is still standing after 2,000 years. I mean, my goodness, if it were up to human beings, it'd be long gone, wouldn't it? Um, Then Moses says, well, I am a terrible public speaker. I mean, I can't be your mouthpiece. I can't speak well. To which God says, well, you have that brother of yours, Aaron. He's a Levite priest. He's a good speaker. You can take him along with you. And finally, he just says, oh, Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Send anybody else. Please, God, I cannot do this, right? And what these excuses remind me of is that God sees the best in us. Even when we are blind to the best that is within us, God sees abilities and gifts that we likely don't even recognize in ourselves. And the more that we allow God to show us who we really are and whose we are, and that God is the one who is behind all of these gifts and abilities, then the stronger we are able to be in what we can do in response to God and the stronger we are able to be as God's children here and now. Um, And I think that goes hand in hand with the flip side. You know, often I think that the reason that we have such an ability to see the worst in other people or to be judgmental of other people is because we're so good at seeing the worst in ourselves. We're so good at seeing what our weaknesses are and showing and, you know, being clear on what we can't do, that we don't allow God to show us what we and others can do. And it can lead us down one of two paths. We can either learn to trust God to be able to use us and allow God to teach us to see the best in other people, or we can wallow in our own sense of inadequacy and ineptitude and allow that to color how we see other people and judge other people. Um, This morning, you may have noticed during the call to worship, I was uh, texting on my phone. And that's because I got a message from Jim Curtis uh, that his wife Diana is in the hospital. And I felt that I needed to respond to that. Uh, So please keep Diana in prayer. Um, And she had a, Um, very low-speed motorcycle accident yesterday. She broke 
her clavicle and five ribs. Yeah. Um, so, which reminded me of uh, a Christmas several years ago. And now one of the things that I do is I treat my phone like a piece of paper. So if I need to remember something, it's going in my phone. Because if I write it on a piece of paper, I will never see that piece of paper again. That's just how my life works. So it was Christmas Eve, and every Christmas, there's at least one detail that is overlooked. And I think to myself, next Christmas, we are going to remember that detail. And the way that I remember it, it goes in my phone. So I'm greeting people at the end of Christmas, and this gentleman who I've never seen before since absolutely lit into me. I mean, raised his voice, hollered at me that I was using my phone during worship, and what kind of a person does that, and on and on and on he went. And I just smiled and nodded and shook his hand and wished him a Merry Christmas. I mean, there's not a lot to do at that point, you know. But it just struck me as an example of the ways that we humans have a tendency to assume the worst of other people. That we have a tendency to assume the, the bad thing rather than the good thing. And God is trying to remind Moses and to get Moses to see that no matter how many bad things we may see in ourselves, no matter how many bad things we may see in other people, God knows that we are more. God knows that we are more able and more capable than we might ever imagine or believe. And so God is saying to Moses, you can do this. Because I am with you, you can do this. And so, I know all of you are comfortable today because I'm hot today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so, um, Next comes Moses going to speak to Pharaoh uh, to ask him for the release of the Hebrew slaves, the release of God's chosen people. And uh, Pharaoh is rather hard-headed. Uh, he is not getting the message that God is serious about the release of these people. It takes 10 plagues for Pharaoh to finally be persuaded. Uh, the, first, we have the water that is turned to blood. The Nile River turns to blood and smells awful. All of the fish die. Uh, then frogs come and just overrun Egypt. Uh, then gnats come, uh, biting insects. Uh, then the flies come. Then the livestock dies. Then, and you, I would think this would be the last one, then everyone breaks out in painful boils. I mean, that would be it for me, you know? Not it for Pharaoh. <clears throat> you know, he starts to weaken, but then he hardens his heart, you know, and says, no, 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 I didn't mean what I said. You can't really leave. Uh, then there's thunder and hail so large that it kills people. Then there's a plague of locusts that eats everything green within the, you know, region. Then there is darkness that is so thick and pervasive, it lasts for three days, and none of the Egyptians can see a thing. And finally... Uh, you know, Pharaoh says, well, you know, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> after the darkness, he says, you can go, but leave all of your livestock here, to which Moses says, not happening, because if they don't take the livestock, they're not going to survive. So finally, God tells them to prepare for uh, what is coming, which is the death of the firstborn. And <clears throat> so we heard the story today of how the Israelites are to prepare for what is coming, that they have uh, this very specific way that they are to prepare for the coming of the Passover in which those who know it is coming, the Israelites are instructed about how to take a one-year-old sheep or goat, which fun fact, did you know that goat is one of the only meats that does not have any religious prohibitions on it in any culture? Random fact I learned from people who raised goats. So, <coughs> um, they're to take a one-year-old male sheep or goat. They are to roast it, not boil it, because, you know, water represented death in these plagues. Uh, they're not to eat it raw. They're to roast it, and there's not to be any leftovers because they're not going to be around for long. Um, they are to have their loins girded. Now, we may know that as a, um, a phrase that means getting ready, 
but if you've ever wondered what it literally means, it literally means having your core muscles engaged the way a good runner would um, just before they take off for a race. So you can think of it like, uh, you know, put on your weightlifting belt or put on your compression running shorts so that you're ready to leave at a moment's notice, have your loins girded. <clears throat> and so this, um, these instructions of course, become the foundation for uh, the Passover meal that is still separated, still celebrated uh, in uh, Jewish faith communities. Um, the Seder ritual meal that accompanies the remembrance of the Passover, the remembrance of how God delivered them out of slavery. It's interesting, it's customary to recite the 10 plagues and to remove a drop of wine from each cup at the table to remember the suffering of the Egyptians and to diminish in some way the happiness of liberation that cost so many innocent lives. Isn't that a beautiful aspect of the Seder meal? I didn't know that until I studied for this message. Um, because the plagues were less about punishing Egyptians and more about showing God's people how mighty God is. God understood the system of death for what it was, for what they were living under. The brick quotas, the beaten backs, the bitter lives, the murdered children. God saw and hear, heard the cries of God's people. And the people are called to let go of the past together. This uh, third verse, 12.3, emphasizes the unity that must happen. If there's not enough in a family to justify the slaughter of a whole sheep or goat, then come together with your neighbors and share it together. The lamb's blood on the doorposts of the houses marks a transition as well. These houses are not their permanent dwellings. They provide a short-term protection, but their most important feature is the doorway the source of entry and exit. The lifeblood of the lamb marks the exit, protecting, hallowing, and preparing their departure from slavery in Egypt. And of course, the Passover meal later becomes symbolic. They eat bitter herbs, a sensory reminder of bereavement and suffering that is meant to be tasted, chewed, swallowed, and digested. The flatbread made without yeast is a bread made in haste and in readiness. The instructions for cooking the lamb are specific. And when they eat of the lamb, they leave nothing behind. As for the people, they eat ready to sprint with their loins girded and their sandals on their feet. <clears throat> and so this is a, uh, a story that is remembered uh, very, very carefully and specifically in the Jewish faith. And of course, it is meaningful to us as well because this is the meal that Jesus celebrated on his last night with his disciples, is the Passover meal. Uh, and so for us, the Passover meal becomes the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, uh, when we come to the table and we remember the freedom that God offers to us. I had a friend in seminary who was just finishing the year that I began, uh, African-American man, and he shared with me a story of one of the first classes he ever took at the seminary, which was with a professor who had uh, retired by the time I got there. Wayne Meeks was the professor's name, older white man, and uh, Gordon commented that he was so taken with Professor Meeks because the way that he began the systematic theology class was to say to his students, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And he was making this as a theological statement that we as God's people are supposed to maintain a sense of identity, a sense of ties with people who are enslaved because God's people were once enslaved too. And that we are to carry that spirit of understanding into our spiritual lives as well. And so with a staff in one hand, a hasty meal in the other, it becomes impossible to hold on to anything else except where God is leading. And so as we think about how this impacts our daily lives, 
um, we think about how it is that we come to the table, that we come to our Passover, which is Holy Communion. This meal is for us, too, a meal to remember our liberation from sin and death, a meal to remind us of God's grace in our lives, a meal in which we celebrate the freedom and grace that God gives us. And this freedom and God in God's grace is what we celebrate today in Lachlan's baptism. It is this day that we welcome her into the covenant faithfulness of our God, in which we get the privilege and the honor of helping to raise her in the faith and in the knowledge of God's love for her and for us all. And so this table and this font are always open, are always available, regardless of any categories that society may try to put us into, regardless of class or race or background or history. God welcomes us all to the table and reminds us that we are to hold fast to the memory of what it is to be God's people, people in need of forgiveness who need to be taught by God how to see the very best in ourselves as God sees us, and how to see the best in others. You know, I joke with you that I've only ever had a few original ideas, right? Everything else I read in books and learn from somebody else. Just really not a joke, it's true. Uh, but <clears throat> the one of the things that I firmly believe is that I don't need to have self-confidence, I just need to have God-confidence. If I could believe that everything God says about me and us is true, I would feel pretty darn good. Uh, if I could truly believe that I am God's chosen, holy and beloved, claimed by God, loved just as I am, that is pretty much all I need to know, right? In order to understand God's love for me and for all of us. And so whenever we come to the table, we tell each other, especially our children, to remember. To remember all that God has done for us, not only in this Passover, but in the cross of Christ. How it is that God has sent his only son to die for our sakes, that we too may rise to new life in him. This new life, which we celebrate today at the baptismal font with Lachlan. And so I invite you, brothers and sisters, as we enter into the sacrament of baptism, to remember that this too is a time in which we recommit ourselves to this baptismal covenant, that this is a reaffirmation for ourselves and our lives, that we too walk in ways that lead to life, and that together we promised God that we will love and cherish and teach Lachlan and all of the children who come to the font in this place. Thanks be to God. Amen.